Good evening, and welcome to Driver's Ed. It's a hot, steamy one. I've got the fan going, got the windows open. Hopefully, uh, you'll be able to hear everything that I have to say tonight, uh, that it won't be too loud. If it is, please make a comment to let me know. We'll wait for people to uh, jump in. So we're gonna wait, we're up to about 10, so make sure that uh, you sign in with your phone. I don't actually have my phone with me, so um, I'll have to take a look at who's here a little bit later. There we go. Now I'm starting to see people coming up. Awesome. So basically what we're going to do tonight is we're going to start off by finishing off the section on on signs, signals, and pavement markings. And then we're going to get into tonight's topic of uh, brake uh, stopping and speed. That is going to put us um, a little bit behind still. Everything's getting pushed back. So remember the midterm will not be tomorrow. So make sure that you um, don't plan on that. So you, it's going to give you the weekend. So we'll take that um, next week sometime. I am going to put this up right now. It looks like we got most people here. Um, I'm going to put, let's see if I can do this right now. Okay, I do have a few openings. So I have 8 o'clock tomorrow morning and 9 o'clock tomorrow morning open. So if anybody can drive one of those times, um, please just text it to me. I don't have my phone uh, with me right now. Um, I left it in the other room. So I'll check my phone later tonight to see who wants to take eight o'clock or nine o'clock tomorrow, uh, preferably somebody that hasn't driven. But if you have driven and that still is a, whoop, let's get that open. So you can take that on Saturday I have 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So lots of times for Saturday. So please try to indicate what your availability is so I can uh, schedule you. Remember, you're meeting me at the high school in front of the high school sign where you picked up your textbook. And that's how we're going to do that. So I'll probably grab my phone sometime during one of the videos that we watch. But... I just want to put that up here right now so you can think about it, check with your parents maybe during tonight's class and find out whether you could get to the school for one of these times. So remember, tomorrow, 8, 9, Saturday is 9, 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So I'm going to get rid of that. All right, let's get right back into what we were covering last night with signs, signals, and uh, pavement markings. Um, we were basically talking about the zipper lane or expressway uh, reversible lanes. So um, let's kind of finish up with what some of the lines actually mean. We already talked about yellow to the left of our car indicates two-way traffic. If it's white, we know it's one way. If it's solid, it means no passing. If it's broken, it is dotted. Uh, I do want you to be familiar with this symbol and with this term. HOV stands for High Occupancy Vehicle. Another term that you will hear is carpooling. You can use that lane. It's the furthest lane on the left on the highway. It's for people that have two or more people in a vehicle or if you are driving in a high occupancy um, energy efficient vehicle. Okay, it doesn't mean high occupancy. It just means a high um, efficiency vehicle. So you get super good gas mileage. They're going to let you drive in that special lane. Now, the interstates and state routes, I do want you to be somewhat familiar with. So please write this down. We talked about the highway transportation system, the HTS. And the highway transportation system is broken up in a grid and it's the interstate system 
And what I want you to write down is that if the number of the interstate, like here we have 17, it has an odd first number, that interstate goes north-south. The one that we're probably familiar with, which is right outside of Portsmouth, is 95. We also have 89 and 93 in New Hampshire. So we only have north-south interstates in New Hampshire. Some states have both. So an even first number, like Interstate 80, would go from east to west. And the other thing that you probably never thought about, you probably don't even know, is when you go from the west coast to the east coast, the odd numbers get higher. So on the west coast, it may be Interstate 5 or uh, 10, and then you're going to find in the middle 30, maybe 50, Interstate 70, and way over on the east coast, we've got 95. So it goes from small odd numbers on the west to high odd numbers to the east. Low even numbers on the south, high even numbers on the north. So the whole United States is a grid. But we also have state routes. And a state route has three digits. Here we have a sign indicating 202. I'm in Rochester, and this is a very common sign around the roads that I drive here in my hometown. But the roads that we drive on for driver's ed in Durham is 108 and 155. So a three-digit route with an odd number only goes through a city. 202 here in Ro excuse me, Rochester goes through or around. It could do both, and 202 does. 202 is also part of the Spalding Turnpike, and it does go through downtown Rochester. So you could actually get off the highway and take 202 through Rochester and get back up onto the highway at a, at a later point. Uh, display stop lines. I do want you to um, write that down. This was the picture that I used for tonight's class because it's not only um, talking about display stop lines but also about stopping, which we'll be getting to uh, sooner. A display stop line is always in the left lane and it's probably 5 to 10 to 15 feet away from where the right stop line is. It's only for large vehicles making wide turns. If a wide vehicle is making a wide turn, it needs that extra distance to make a clearance without hitting the front end of a vehicle. So this is why it's so important that you hit your stop lines head on, right on the line. You don't want to overextend it at any part. A lot of people say, well, wonder if I go beyond it two or three feet, what should I do? Well, hope and pray that there isn't a large truck coming, but if there is one, checking your rearview mirror, you may have to back up because he's not going to be able to make his turn. But normally, you do not put your car in reverse and back up. This is another reason why you always want to see the tires of the car that's in front of you because that gives you a little bit of a space cushion. So if you did have to back up, um, you're able to do that. Now, I thought this was kind of funny. Um, hopefully you do too. Even police officers will make mistakes. Notice that this police officer is beyond the display stop line. Now, we have two of them in Durham, one here in the UNH campus over near the uh, WIT, and the other display stop line is on 108 over near the Irving gas station. The Irving gas station isn't quite as um, extended further back as this is, but that police car has his whole vehicle over the stop line. Um, I thought that was kind of funny. And notice the light is red. So it's not like a green light and he's just moving forward and I took a picture. He is someplace that he is not supposed to be. Okay, let's talk a little bit about school bus safety and hopefully we'll be going back to school in September. The state is very strict on the behavior of cars around school buses because we must protect our young children especially early in the morning, 
late afternoon when they're getting on the bus or getting off a bus. So here are a few things that I want you to write down and remember. With school bus safety, a school bus that is picking up children will always have to indicate they're picking someone up by putting on their yellow lights first. So whenever they're probably about 150, 200 feet away, yellow lights will start to flash. That is giving you warning that you should be slowing down. So the yellow lights absolutely have to come on before the red lights. Now, school buses not only have red lights flashing, indicating that they're picking up kids, but they have a stop sign that is going to stick out. Now, this is actually from Durham. I was with a student, we were driving, and we got behind a school bus and I just took out my phone and I took this picture. So let's take a look at this school bus and how they're uh, reacting. So notice the flashing red lights, the school sign has popped out. The kids are way out away from the school bus. This, the bus driver has to wait till all of them have been discharged. Some of them will walk to the front. Some of them may walk off to the same side the distance that the driving student is stopped behind the bus is more than 25 feet. Okay, that's probably closer to like 40 feet. But the minimum, let me get out of here, the minimum is 25. Now on a test, a lot of people say, well, how am I supposed to remember all these numbers? The way that I remember 25 feet is I think, can I squeeze two vehicles in front of me and the bus? If I can squeeze two cars, then I probably have close to 25 feet. That also is gonna hopefully trigger your mind that the number that I'm looking for has a two at the beginning. So it's either gonna be 20 or 25. They always do in, in driving. Everything is in fives and tens. You're never gonna see 17. You're never gonna see 87. You're not gonna see 43. Everything's in fives and tens, okay? and be very cautious about kids that may still linger around a school bus. Especially when it's warm weather, they may be throwing things to their friends that are hanging out the back window. Uh, you just don't wanna do that. Let me show you, I, I found an article, a news report on TV, and I can't remember specifically how many children, but it was, I believe, in the, in the fall. How many children in one week, I think it was like six, six kids in a short period of time were killed getting off or getting on their bus. That's insane. Okay, this shouldn't happen. The one reason why this is happening is that people are not paying attention to what they're driving. They're either going too fast or they're distracted on their phone. Let me show you the, uh, the newscast. Oh, Lord have mercy terror at a school bus stop in Tampa this morning. I didn't know which kid to help because there was so many laying on the ground. Witnesses say a speeding car slammed into five children and two adults, leaving one child in critical condition. The driver now in custody. One of four accidents at school bus stops in just the past three days. In central Pennsylvania this morning, a seven-year-old killed in a hit and run. The driver never even stopping to help. While in Mississippi, this man is now charged with aggravated assault after a nine-year-old was struck and killed. And in Indiana, a community is mourning three siblings killed this week crossing the road on their way to the bus. That driver also facing charges. Some 25 million students nationwide ride a school bus, but experts say getting on and off can be the most dangerous time, especially this time of year. Right before daylight saving time ends, it's often dark as children wait in the morning. So reflective clothing or backpacks can help and teach children to line up away from the street, stay alert, and never assume a driver will stop. A deadly lesson learned the hard way for so many this week. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, New York. Hey, NBC News fans. So that, that's pretty shocking that that many kids in that amount of time. So there's the three kids. So it really wiped out an entire family. And I, from what I understand on another news report that I saw that the mother, I believe, actually saw it happen. I cannot imagine um, the thoughts that must cross her mind on a daily, it just, it's just heartbreaking.
Okay, railroad crossings. Always look for signs. Now, the two signs that I want you to be familiar with, write this down. A circle sign is a railroad sign. It's yellow, and it has a what we call a cross buck. The sign that is in this PowerPoint picture is a cross buck sign. You're always going to see a yellow circle cross buck sign before you see the actual track sign. Now, when you do come to the cross buck sign here, you have to stop at least 25 feet from the track, no more than 50 feet. Now, the reason why 15 is so important is because if a train derailed, if the train came off the track, if you're closer than 15 feet, it's going to crush you. It's going to go right on top of your vehicle and probably right where you're seated as a driver. And most railroad crossings will have double tracks in the city. Now, on rural areas, it'll probably be a single track. But if you're driving and you're going over a railroad track, I'll almost guarantee in the city there's two tracks. So don't be so quick when the gate goes up to be shooting right across because there could be a train coming from the opposite direction. So let's take a look at train safety. And I was at a conference and this particular individual that is in this video, um, he's from the Northeast. He provided this clip for everybody that attended. So I, I told him that we'd show it in class. He says there's no reason why drivers should have any uh, contact with a moving train. The signals do work. If they don't work, the, the drivers should slow down, uh, look both ways before they proceed over tracks. But drivers should never, 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 never come in contact with a moving train. It should just shouldn't happen. So let me show you the railroad video that he provided. The first train car northbound is on fire. We have multiple injuries. 600,000 ton train that could be barreling down and hitting you. We hit a big truck. We're on the ground. It's a horrifying experience. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh! Hundreds of people are killed at crossings every year, and these are completely preventable. One of the ways we can prevent these accidents is for the public to do their job. The emergency notification system provides motorists or pedestrians with a phone number that they can call, and then we'll be able to stop train traffic that's heading in that direction. the first phone call you want to make if there's anything happening at a crossing. You want to stop any oncoming train. Every grade crossing is protected with an emergency notification sign. What that provides is an emergency notification phone number that the passenger or the motorist can immediately notify the railroad of any emergency at that crossing. The locator crossing number, which is six digits and a letter, can effectively tell the train dispatcher exactly where they are. When you call that number, you're talking to the train dispatcher that's specifically associated with that railroad. You'll get a response right away. The train dispatcher picks up, and he's going to ask, what location are you at? You give him that DOT number, just stay clear of the tracks. Let the dispatcher handle everything from that point on. Once you get that call in, for me to contact my, the locomotive engineer on the train, it could be five, ten seconds. I'm going to get him on the radio immediately and say, bring your train to a safe stop. This, we have an emergency situation ahead. Call 911 is not going to stop the train from coming. The first responder is your train dispatcher in this case. That 800 number is going to get you right to the first responder.
Unfortunately, far too often people get complacent around railroad tracks. That's really a recipe for harm or, or disaster. If you're towing a vehicle, um, if you're a fire engine responding to an emergency situation, you still need to let the railroad know that you're in that space, that you are close to the tracks or you're on the tracks. The ENS sign can be located in many places, either on the cross buck, directly at the crossing, or on the silver box, which is usually located adjacent to the crossing. So you should call it if you suspect that the gates are malfunctioning, if you see a vehicle that's stuck on the tracks, if you see any suspicious activity, if you see something that looks out of place, or an object that's obstructing the tracks. As soon as your vehicle is stuck on the tracks and the crossing is activated, you need to get away from that vehicle as soon as possible and run at a 45 degree angle towards the train. Far too many times we see people trying to save their vehicles. And the unfortunate reality is when they're trying to save their vehicles, in many cases they lose their life. These incidents also have a profound impact on locomotive engineers. That individual may have long-term effects from this incident that affect them professionally and personally. It's not, it's not gonna stop. If something happens and you are stuck on the grade crossing, the first thing you want to do is get your car off. So just drive through the gate. The gates are meant to break away and so you will be able to get to the other side. You never want to be stuck at a crossing. So don't try to get over the crossing until you know you can get to the other side. Don't be stuck in traffic and sitting on a grade crossing, on a railroad crossing in the path of a train. It's a horrifying experience. We've had careers that have been ended as a result of these incidents. Every one of these accidents breaks our heart, and we need to do everything we possibly can to keep people off those crossings and away from trains. A lot of folks look at active grade crossings where you have gates and arms as an inconvenience and an annoyance. Those arms are not there to prevent you from being where you want to be, but to help you get there safely. So hopefully you took away some of the, um, the key points of calling the number, the ENS number, if the tracks aren't uh, operating properly, to run away at a 45 degree, and to go through the gate if you have to. Uh, you just don't want to be stuck on the tracks. You, you, you wouldn't think that many people would have issues with railroad crossings, but every year, every year somebody is having a major problem with the railroad tracks. Okay, let's talk about right of way. There are basically eight, what we call conditions or situations where right of way will take place. So let's come up with what is the definition of right of way? What does the law require? The law doesn't really give anyone the right of way. It only says who must yield it. Now, I always like to tell people when you see the word yield, yield is one of those words that people just can't formulate a definition for. So I always like to use the word weight. So if you look at that sentence, replace yield with the word weight, only who must wait. So always thinking about, am I the one that needs to wait? 
So generally at an intersection with no traffic control sign or signal, the vehicle on the right gets to go first. They have the right of way. But there are conditions, there are situations. So let's kind of go through them. First one, a vehicle in the intersection has the right of way over a vehicle preparing to enter. So that means the car is already in, he's going through, let him go, don't cut him off. A vehicle going straight has the right of way over someone that is turning left. So you're both coming at the same time. You both have a stop sign, one's going straight, one's turning left. The one that's going straight goes first. The one that's turning left has to wait. Emergency vehicles, we must wait for them. We must let them go by. We pull over to the side of the road and we wait. We wait for them to go. Pedestrians in a crosswalk, we must wait till they cross all the way, or at least halfway, like I said, if it's Durham where there's a lot of pedestrians going through. Vehicles on a main road have the right of way over people in a driveway or a side road. So if you're in a driveway, you must wait till there's an opening in traffic. You're yielding. Blind people, okay? They can't see. So they overrule. They overrule you. They get to go wherever they want to go. And they can't see a crosswalk, so they may not even be in it. Although some of them do a pretty good job finding it. They've been trained how to use their guide dog or their stick. Remember, a blind person is a person with a uh, guide dog with a harness. Not a leash, but a harness or a um, service dog uh, blanket. Has a white cane with a red tip. All indicators that the person's blind. And of course, the driver that gets at the intersection first, regardless of where they're going, gets to go first over anybody else that is preparing to enter. Okay, emergency vehicles. I thought I had a um, video for this, but I can't find it. So I'm going to probably have to use it a little bit later. So I'll have to remember to um, go over that. So I just want to touch on a few other things before we close up this subject on sign signals and pavement markings. Your vehicle is a powerful machine. Once you learn how to drive it and you think you're pretty good at it, remember it is to get you to where you want to go. When you start using it as a, um, a toy, as for your amusement, and you start fooling around, someone's going to get hurt. I found this to be disheartening, and I just can't believe that a sister who would accidentally run over her brother. Apparently, they were playing some type of game in a mall parking lot of uh, running around the vehicle trying to stop jumping in front of the car she was slamming the brake i i don't get that i just don't okay don't fool around with your vehicle because something bad's going to happen so let's talk about some other things about vehicles how about if you have a pickup truck we know that it's a law to be buckled if you're under the age of 18. now this is uh, when UNH was still in session, it was in the fall, it was a football game going on. I'm sure they're all going to the game. But a couple of things. Way too many people in that vehicle. I would suspect that most of them are over 18. So legally, they probably don't have to be in a seatbelt. But if that truck had to stop quickly or swerve, there's no way that those people standing up are going to be still in the pickup truck they're going to get thrown and the picture to the right i just don't get they've crossed over the center line over into the incoming incoming lane i i just don't know why they're doing that uh, maybe they're trying to get into a, the parking lot but i don't know why they're not staying in their lane so that could lead to problems so don't be in the back of a pickup if you are you should be sitting on the bed not standing up like that. A few other things about passengers in a vehicle. Don't let people sit on the hood, roof, or trunk of a car. 
Uh, if I had you in class, would go around the room and I'd try to find out how many people have experienced this. Uh, usually it's pretty high. Um, and as you saw from the picture, don't be in the back of a pickup truck. Um, don't carry anything on the left side of the car for more that has more than six inches on the right side. So if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you've got lumber, make sure it's sticking out the right, not the left. But if it's on the right, make sure it doesn't protrude more than that six inches. You should limit the people in the front of your um, car to at least three people. Anything more than that, they're going to be interfering with the controls of the car. House or utility trailer you shouldn't be in. A house trailer is something that has a hitch. It's not a Winnebago. It's not a, you know, a drivable RV. We're talking about one that's being towed. Utility trailer is what you take to the dump. You, you don't put people in the back there to hold down the, the bags of leaves. Okay, you, you strap them down. And this is probably one of the biggest ones I want you to write down and, and remember. I'm a big uh, dog fan. Usually my dog is with me in the room right here. But dogs have to be tethered in a pickup truck. So if you put them in the back, in the bed, that means tethered means to be tied on both sides. All right? Tethered means to be tied on both sides. And that you're giving a little bit of leeway. Let me show you. So tethered means that tied on both sides and the dog can move a little bit to the left, the dog can move a little bit to the right, it can move forward, it can move back. What you don't want is just tied on one side and then the dog jumps over the side of the pickup because it saw another dog, it's gonna create a problem where you're dragging your own dog and that's gonna give road rash to your pet and we don't want that to happen. Well, that takes care of Sign signals, pavement markings. Now, the new manual doesn't do a very extensive discussion on stopping. So we're going to get into that right now. So the thing I want you to think about with stopping and the way that it was listed in the old manual, it was always before the section on speed. I think you can remember me mentioning the first or second class that when it comes to car controls, you have three. You have a brake, an accelerator, and steering. Of the three things, the most important thing to learn how to control first when you're learning to drive is the brake pedal. So stopping, in reality, is more important than speed. Stopping is going to get you out of trouble. If you don't stop well, it will actually put you into trouble. And we don't want that. All right, so in your notes, what I want you to write down, and we had a whole section a couple classes ago about using our eyes, visual acuity, depth perception, inattention, blindness, all that. You must see the road ahead to plan ahead. So you're not going to be able to stop well if you don't see the stop sign or you don't see the stop line. You're going to be at a major, major disadvantage. So stopping requires vision in order for it to happen. So, with all stopping, write this down, you want more time to stop. You never want less time. Think about it. If someone says, you've got to stop, I'm only going to give you three seconds. Or if they said, I'm going to give you eight seconds, wouldn't you pick the eight? Absolutely. Okay, more time is going to mean a more gentler uh, maneuver. You're, you're not going to be jamming the brakes down. And I don't know if it was someone from this class or it was someone from my previous class, but just a few days ago, we had to hit the brakes so hard that we, we skidded. We laid rubber. We almost hit a bicyclist that went out in front of us. And time does matter. If we didn't have decent following distance with a decent speed, that bicycle would have been on our hood. All right? that it, it, it's one of the closest calls we've had in a, in a long time. Let me show you, let me show you this, um, this video right here about why a slower speed makes a big difference.
just five miles per hour over the 30 miles per hour speed limit, how much further will it take to stop? One foot, two feet, three feet, four feet, five feet, six feet, seven feet, eight feet, nine feet, 10 feet, 11 feet, 12 feet, 13 feet, 14 feet, 15 feet, 16 feet, 17 feet, 18 feet, 19 feet, 20 feet, Twenty one feet. So, what I want you to write down in your notes is drop your speed down by five miles per hour in a, ha a heavy traffic pedestrian area. When people are just crossing here and there, a lot of cars are backing in and out of the street. You're going through town. There are a lot of traffic lights. I, I can't understand. I know the speed limit's 25 or 30 in the city, depending on where you're driving, but it makes no sense to be driving at the speed limit if you can't handle what is happening around you. You're not picking up pedestrians. You're not seeing people back up. Your stopping is so hard. That means you're going too fast. You're only going through town for a short period of time. Go slow. There's nothing wrong with going 18, 23 miles per hour, you know, a much slower speed than what's posted. But you have to handle anything that arises in these high risk and high contact areas. And that's an old video because the back tires locked right up. Um, once the brakes were engaged, um, there were no anti-lock braking system on that car. But you can see it, it takes a great distance, even at in-town speed, to stop. So if you think a person jumps out in front of you, you're going to have enough time, you, you probably are wrong. I, I love asking people how at going, and let's do this right now. I'll, I'll do this. I'm going to show another video in a moment, but I want everybody in the YouTube channel, okay? I want everybody at, um, let me give you a speed, at 40 miles per hour. Okay, you're traveling 40 miles per hour. How long does it take to stop a vehicle? From the time that you see something, let's say an animal came out in front of you, 40 is probably, you know, Route 155, 108. An animal comes out in front of you. From the time that you see the animal to the time you stop your car, you're gonna need how much, how many, how many feet? So write it in the YouTube comments so I can see it. I don't still don't have my phone. And I'm gonna show this video about um, speed. What you're about to see will change your mind about speeding. Two identical cars, one traveling at 60, the other at 65. A sudden change in the road ahead. And both drivers first react and then a moment later they brake. And things start to get interesting. Down here, the difference is extraordinary. In the last five meters of braking, you wipe off half your speed. So this car is still doing 32 k's when it hits. This one also hits, but only at five k's. So no matter how good a driver you are, five k's difference up there makes 27 k's difference down here. So please, in your notes, put down, drop your speed by five miles per hour. It is going to give you extra distance to stop. Once you get beyond your troubled area, if you think it's safe, then you can pick your, then you can pick your speed back up. So I'm waiting to see more people to Answer the question at 40 miles per hour. Now here's a definition I want you to be familiar with.
Even when road and vehicle conditions are ideal and the driver is perfectly alert, it takes a great distance to stop a motor vehicle. Through the use of good judgment and knowledge of stopping distance, you can reduce the chance of being involved in a crash. Now, what we're trying to key on tonight is giving you some good judgment and knowledge about stopping distance. So, because we've got a, a probably a two minute delay between what I'm saying and how you respond to the question, uh, this program, you know, I guess it could be a little bit more interactive, more timely, but I think most people have answered the question. I'm gonna scan through real quick and find out who is closest to the answer. And there are two people, actually one is, we got three people that did a fine job of guessing. Joseph, Cole, and Laura were the closest to the actual answer. And I mean really close. It's basically about 149, 145 feet at 40 miles per hour to stop a car at 40 miles per hour. So for some of you that are below 100, I think the lowest number I'm seeing is 70. I mean, think about it, 70 feet at 40 miles per hour, that's really only like four car lengths, maybe five car lengths, depending on the length of the car. Um, so it takes a great deal. We overestimate what our ability to stop a vehicle. So let's talk about what is the process of stopping a vehicle. So I want you to write this down in your notes. This will be on the final. To stop your vehicle, three things have to happen. The first thing is you have to see and recognize the need to stop. I, I had someone drive today. I don't think they're in the class. No, they're not. And we were working on lane changes. And we go in this particular area and we go around downtown Durham three times to do a number of lane changes. On our second loop around, so they've already been by this area earlier in our drive. They totally missed the stop sign. Totally missed it. I said, how... How can you miss that stop sign? You stopped for it about 10 minutes ago. Just didn't see it. I forgot all about it. If you don't see something, your eyes could be focused on something totally different. And you're going to miss it. And you're going to think, how can I miss that stop sign? It's staring at me. Just like we said two, two classes ago. Inattention blindness is real. Uh, you're going to be surprised when you drive the things that you're missing that people are going to point out to you now the second thing your brain has to tell your foot to step on the brake pedal now you may think that's pretty straightforward of course once my eyes see it my mind is thinking of it so of course my foot is going to step on the brake no why is there going to be a disconnect between your brain and your foot fatigue maybe alcohol drugs prescription drugs distraction now your brain is saying foot we got to slow down you see a stop sign but then you take your focus and you're looking at the radio station and you're trying to get the score of the Red Sox all of a sudden your your brain is also multitasking about something other than the stop sign it's it's going to affect the way that you're stopping and lastly your foot must move to the brake pedal and use the brake correctly and makes you don't get any extra credit in life for going to the brake and saying, officer, I didn't mean to hit that pedestrian. I was on my brake. I was slowing down. Well, yeah, you were slowing down, but you still hit them. You got to stop. You got to make sure that it, it is complete to the degree of what you need. So if it needs a certain amount of pressure, you've got to give it that amount of pressure. Anything less than that, and you're going to be crashing into things, going beyond your stop lines. And that's what makes it so, so tricky. Now, here are some definitions, and I believe it's in the textbook. I didn't take out my textbook. Oh, here we go. I got it right here. Okay, let's talk about human reaction. All right. 
The time it takes from the moment you see danger until you step on the brake is called reaction time. The distance that you travel during that period is called reaction distance. Now what I want you to write down is that the average person takes about three quarters of a second. So my question to you, are you an average driver? The answer is no. You are not an average driver. You're a beginner. It's going to take you longer. Even though your reaction may be good, you're not picking up the information vision-wise as well as an experienced driver. Yes, they are talking about this. It's on page 16 in the, in the manual if you want to go to the top left-hand corner about stopping distance. So this is where we're kind of getting this from if you want to underline it in the, in the manual. So page 16. Now there are two other terms that I want you to know is braking time and that is the time it takes for the brakes and the friction between the road and the tires to stop the vehicle and braking distance is the distance that you're traveling during that period of time. So there's four definitions. Reaction time, reaction distance, braking time, braking distance. Now what else goes into stopping? The surface of the road, okay? A dirt road, you're not gonna stop as well as a paved road. The condition of your brakes, um, the size of your brake pads, the weather. We talked about fatigue, we talked about drugs, we talked about being distracted. So a lot of things go in to stopping. So you really want your vehicle maintained and the best possible condition you want to make sure that if it's bad weather you're giving yourself more time and distance to stop and the one thing that we haven't talked about and I want to show you a short video clip uh, that was done by a tire company is your tires are huge in stopping distance your tires are so important the only reason why you have tread on your tire is not for stopping in good weather it's stopping in bad weather. Okay, write that down. The only reason why you have tread on your tire is for stopping in bad weather. The best possible tire to have, like if it's really nice out, let's say 75, nice pavement, paved well, you want a tire that has no tread at all. If you look at a race car that go that goes like 180 to 210 miles per hour. They don't have tread on their tires and they're going at those incredible speeds and going around those corners. Now the, the banking of the, of the road surface helps, but more rubber on the road gives you more adhesion, more traction. The reason why we have grooves is to take the rain and the snow and to push it, push it away. So your tires play a big factor, whether it be dry or wet weather. So let's take a look at, at tires, okay? Let's see if this comes up. We tested the effect worn tires have on stopping distance. 60 miles per hour on a wet road. Three sets of tires, each with different tread depths and one professional driver. When the driver accelerated to 60 miles per hour, watch what happened when he tried to stop. While your actual distances may vary, it took him nearly 10 additional car lengths to stop on worn tires. So, when will you stop? Ask about our complimentary tire inspections. So that's a good advertisement for why you should make sure you have good tires so let's talk about tires just for a second um, my car driver's ed car has to be inspected this month I did put four new tires on the vehicle about a month and a half ago because uh, I knew that it was going to be heavy driving this this summer but when you go shopping for tires please write this down do not go cheap 
there are going to be tires that are, let's just say, around ninety to one hundred and ten dollars, and then they're going to go up to like two fifty, three hundred dollars. I don't expect you to pay per tire the most expensive tire, but you're doing a disservice to you um, and your driving if you're buying the the cheapest tire that you can find. Try to find something that is middle of the road. Um, that will give you long life, meaning that you're not going to have to replace them that often, but it's still going to give you the safety, as we just saw, for um, for stopping. And they're going to be drivable. You'd be surprised. The, the type of rubber that they use and the tread design will um, cause the car to make noise and how your ride will be, meaning how smooth the ride will be. You ever put winter tires on a car, been on a car with winter tires? They've got the real aggressive tread. Your car doesn't drive as well. It's, it's safer because it's gripping the road better, but it's not the most enjoyable ride. So you've got to balance out. And some people swap out um, all radial tires for winter tires um, in the winter. I kind of go with an all weather tire and use them all year long. Um, only drive when it's really uh, safe to drive. I don't really get into going through deep snow, so we don't drive a lot in heavy, heavy snow with, with our teaching and our driving. So that is on stopping. So let's talk a little bit about speed. I am going to guess that there are at least a few of you that are in this class that have been in a car over 100 miles per hour. Now, hopefully you're not the one that was driving. I think maybe your parents would be surprised to know that you were in a vehicle that was going that fast. If it wasn't 100 miles per hour, it was probably pretty darn close. Remember your parents were young once too. So if you were to ask them, have they ever been in a vehicle over 100 miles per hour when they were in high school? I would bet you'd come back and report that, yeah, my parents admitted that they've been in a car going that fast. Now, some of you may even have to admit your parents were driving that fast. Maybe you had a chance to go to Europe and drive on the Autobahn where it's legal. Uh, maybe your dad is really into racing and he took you to the track and you got to go in a vehicle with him going that fast. So there are times where, you know, you can go in a vehicle. There's nothing wrong. Don't get me wrong. There is nothing wrong with going at a high rate of speed. Unless, you know, but you've got to make sure that your car is built for it, that you use your safety belts, um, you take precautions, you're doing it in a safe area that's not going to do harm to other people. But can you be in a vehicle at that rate of speed and technically still be safe? Yeah. That's why the Autobahn doesn't have a lot of accidents and people drive at a regular speed of between probably 100 and 160. Uh, but you got to remember, our roads aren't built like that. Um, our cars may not be to that extent that can handle that high speeds. So please don't try to do that out on 95 or on the Spalding. I don't want you to do that. But I want to show you how your attitude about speed can change. So let me show you this commercial that was on TV probably about five years ago. Uh, and I al also tell students that this is the way that I feel driving with you sometimes and you're going around your corners too fast. So let me sh let me show you this. Oh, wow! Yeah, nice and easy. Mm -hmm. Head on out yeah. whenever you're ready. Are you ready to go ahead and yeah and drive? Okay, yeah, sure. Oh, whoa! <laughs> That's all right. Oh, a little more than I'm used to. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's got some power, so just get a feel for it. Okay. Okay, all right. He's off just a little bit. He's off. So I was thinking a lot more age on me, some wrinkles, a little dorky, maybe some facial hair. And somebody that I can pull off a, a fun prank with. <laughs> Let's go have some fun. My good friends at Pepsi Max have hooked us up with this cool cam cam. So these are the glasses cam to show you everything that I see. How you doing? Hello. I'm Mike. Steve, nice to meet you, Mike. I saw you sort of gravitated towards the Camaro. Are you thinking about getting one? Oh, no, no, no. This this way too much car for me. I'm Well, it's a lot of power, but they've designed it to be very safe. I don't know if I can handle it. I, I've never driven anything like this before. Well, I... I tell you what, I think a way to really make you feel comfortable would be to put you behind the wheel. You're good. <laughs> 
What are you driving now? Oh, just a minivan. Oh, yeah. yeah what am I You're signing not here? You sure? it's, it's just a checkout sheet for a test drive. You're not obligated to anything. It's just so we know who's out. Let's go give it a drive. You're getting you a little nervous. No. I'll be right there beside you. There are your keys, sir. Thank you, Steve. But you'll have to unlock it, Mike. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. There we go. Oh, yeah. What a car. Mm -hmm. Well, we better buckle up. Yeah, good call. Power. Power door locks. Standard, of course. You are liable for any damages to the vehicle, so please stop the car. Slow, or at least slow down. Slow down. Slow down. You can't go through that gate, Mike. Stop! 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 Watch it! Watch out! You're gonna wreck this car, and you're liable for it if you wreck it. Mike! Stop the car! Stop the car right now! Shut up here! It's not what you think. It's not what you cops. think. No, it's just a prank. We're just having fun. Look, this is a camera. Here's a camera. There's cameras. Look, it was all just fun. Look, I'm Jeff Gordon. <laughs> Sorry, man. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Can we do it again? Yeah. <laughs> I love his reaction at the very end of the video. Now, he was scared. He was so scared. He thought his life was ending. But at the end of the video, when he found out it was a prank and it was a professional driver, and then he was safe, he was just being played with, he thought it was great, let's do it again. It's funny how when you're driving with people, and now maybe you've been a passenger, maybe you could put this in a comment, Put down in the comments on YouTube, have you ever driven with one of your friends who has just gotten their license and they made you nervous, but yet they think that they're a decent driver. They've passed driver's ed. They've got their license and they think they're good, but you're driving with them and you're going, oh my goodness, they're going to wreck the car. I'm going to die. You, you get really nervous with some of your friends. So put it, don't put down names of who makes you nervous, but write down in the comments whether you've driven with some of your high school friends and they make you nervous. It's funny how when you drive, you think you're in control. You think that you're a good driver. Other people are looking at you and going, oh my goodness, they have no idea that they're too close to the right. They're missing things as they go by. They're, they're going way too fast for their corners. Speed is a very subjective thing. So take my criticism when you drive with me, your parents' criticism, under advisement, we're trying to make you a better driver. We want you to, to understand that slow or a, a decent speed is not bad. And we may quarrel about what is a decent speed. But we'll talk about that as we get into the subject of speed. So is going the speed limit always the safest speed to travel? And the answer to that question is no. Is going the speed limit always the safest? No, because we don't know if it's raining. Like today, we were coming over the George Sullivan Bridge in Portsmouth. I was driving with a student. We were doing the highway lesson and, and it poured. We could barely see the road. It, we could barely see the lines. There's no way we could actually go the speed limit. The speed limit was 55. I had them going 35, and even that I thought was um, uh, too much for us. But he did a great job. Real good driver. 
I didn't feel he was out of control, but I was afraid of how other people would see us and where we could actually find. Um, I already showed you that video. So who's in control? You gotta remember, you are the one that's driving. So once you get your license, if you're making someone feel uncomfortable, please listen to what they're saying. Don't try to shame them and make them feel like they're a wussy, that they can't handle it. They're, you know, a bunch of, you know, uh, no fun friends. Uh, you have their life in your hands when you're driving. Driving's a big responsibility. And this is why the state only wants you to have one non-relative in the vehicle. Not because they don't want you to have fun or not to help out uh, friends to get to where they're going, but if there is any type of a crash, they want to make sure liability wise, there's not a lot of people that are going to be hurt. There's a lot to be said about getting a lot of driving, even though you've done the 10 with me, 40 with your parents, it's still going to take you a, a number of years. Actually, the insurance company, and you're going to find this hard to believe, the insurance company does not reward you for safe driving until the age of 24. You're basically driving for the next eight years before an insurance company really believes you are what you are. They're not taking just three years, four years as a, an example. Now, they do give you some credit, but you're going to see a remarkable drop in your insurance rate once you get out of college, once you're around 23, 24. So everybody looks at you as a high-risk driver. So what is considered a safe speed? A safe speed is one that allows you to have complete control of the vehicle. That means you can steer around corners to the right, to the left. You can stop at your stop signs, your traffic lights. There's nothing on the road that is coming towards you that you should not be able to handle. Once your speed is going so fast that you can't stop at your lines, make your turns, you are going too fast. If you cannot stay in your lane when you make a turn, you are going too fast. It's basic. And then we haven't even begun to talk about what happens when you have a tire that blows out. What happens when a moose walks in front of your vehicle? What happens if there's a pothole that's just around a corner when you're driving? These are all situations that you do not plan for. They're not around every day, but they do happen maybe once or twice a year. You're gonna be you're gonna have to handle those situations. So braking is kind of the opposite of speed, of course, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? Boy, that was really bright. Um, so anything that will affect braking makes sense that it will affect speed. So when we were talking about stopping, we talked about weather, we talked about roads, we talked about our condition. Just make sure that you understand that's the flip side of speed. That's going to come into the equation. So road conditions, how well you see, how much traffic there is, all play a major factor on what you're choosing for speed. So what determines what they have for speed limits? It's basically by traffic engineers that have looked at the design of the road by police reports where people have had crashes but when we come down to speed the way to look at it is vehicles moving in the same direction going the same speed usually don't have problems crashes happen when we have people that are going faster or slower and we can't deal with the differences with everybody so we want everybody to be grouped together going the same speed so the safest speed is the average speed that traffic is is going. I'm gonna get out of here for a second. So I want you to make sure you write this down and make sure that your parents understand my philosophy about speed. And I think I mentioned this the first week of class. I am allowing you to go five, above five below before I probably will say something. If it's a nice day, if we're not following anybody too closely. If we're too close or if weather's bad, I'm gonna pipe in a lot. But on a good day, nobody in front of us, the speed limit's 40, you're going 43, 44. 
I'm probably not going to say too much. I, I want you to be close to the speed limit within that five range as much as you can. But it does not give you um, leeway to make that 40 a 45 for our whole drive time for the whole hour. No, no, no. Okay. Because you're going up a hill, down a hill, there's going to be fluctuation in speeds. So I'm not going to hold you to be needle perfect all the time. So please remember, be as close to the speed limit as you possibly can. I am trying to train you so when you go for your driver's test that they're going to see a person that has good lane position, uses their eyes, their mirrors, and can hold a constant speed near the speed limit. But I also don't want you to be this type of driver where you're looking up and down like every five seconds, afraid that if you go 41, 42, and a 40, that I'm going to scream at you or use my instructor brake. That's not making you a good driver. That's making you paranoid. All right. But then again, I don't want you to think that there are no speed limits. And if there's nobody around, you can go as fast as you want. That is wrong. That that's not right. You're going to get in trouble for that. Not only with the police for speeding, but I'll guarantee that you're going to come to a bend in the road or a hill and you're just not going to be able to handle what's what's up ahead. Those those speed limits are there for a reason. You just got to get used to going it. So these are all things that we've talked about already and that uh, you already had through your reading. Um, oh, let's talk about how, how do the police know how fast you're going? Do they just watch your, your car coming down the road and uh, say, that car looks like it's going fast. I think I'm going to pull it over. And by the way, okay, it's a myth that they're pulling over more red cars than any other car or they're pulling over yellow cars or white cars. The color of your car has nothing to do with with the speed uh, that uh, the police pull you over because of your speed. It's because of the red car is going fast. That's why the yellow car is going fast. But the police monitor speed by, I want you to write down your notes three ways, by radar, laser, and aircraft. And a lot of you are probably saying, what do you mean by aircraft? How, how can they monitor me by the air? They actually, on a highway, will paint strips on the breakdown lane, and they will time you from one point to another point. And if you get to that second point faster than you should, they can figure out mathematically what your speed limit is. It's a mathematical equation. Isn't that wild? So what they're going to do is they're going to radio up ahead to a police officer that's maybe two miles up the road, and they're going to say, "Blue, uh, pull over that blue Chevy, that blue Chevy truck. So the blue Chevy truck is listening to his country music, singing along. He has no idea that he's going 14 miles over the speed limit. And all of a sudden, there's a police officer in the road. He's out of his cruiser, and he's pointing at him, and he's, he's, going, he's doing this. He's pointing at him, and he's saying, you, pull over. Now, if you see a police officer out of his cruiser and he's pointing at you and he's telling you, pull over, you're going, me? Me? Yeah. Pull over. Do as the officer says. Don't say, well, he's out of his cruiser. I'm just going to blow by him. I'm going to go down the road, take a side road. He'll never find me. They probably already have your license plate, by the way. Say, don't do that. If, if the officer doesn't want you, he wants the car behind you, He's going to look at you and tell you, no, not you. I want the guy behind you. Okay, so just keep going. But this is how they uh, detect speed. Oh, let me play it. I don't even have it up. Hold on. If you reckon you can get away with speeding, look at this. Police radars are more sophisticated than ever. He's about a kilometre away, this fella. Watch this. Got him. Yeah, no idea. Here you go. Just slow down. It's not worth it. Over 200 cars with these radars are out day and night. And back in town, the new ProLight lasers can pinpoint a speeding driver in busy traffic and catch him. It's just not worth speeding because we'll catch you before someone gets hurt. So that is how they actually use radar and laser. Now, it's a cat and mouse game. The police know that you have detectors in your vehicles. People buy detectors because they want to drive fast and not get caught and have to pay fines and pay high insurance rates. 
You've got to remember that in some states that would be illegal to have a radar detector. Okay, radar detector is not illegal in New Hampshire. Um, but I want you to know that I'm not a believer of radar detectors because they only work when an officer has left his radar on unattended. So that means that officer's on the side of the road, he's doing some paperwork, speed limit's 40. He says, well, I'm going to pull over any car that's going 48, 49 miles per hour. He sets the radar for that. So once a car gets within range, if he's going 48, 49 miles per hour, inside the cruiser, it's going to make a noise. He can look up. He can see the car. He could put down his computer and go get the vehicle. Now, if that car had a radar detector inside, it would do the same thing. It would say there's a police officer up ahead. He's looking at my speed, and then you're dropping your speed because you know that he's there. So you're trying to drop it down before he notices. The problem is that most police officers have, as you saw in that last video, is a gun. They only turn on the radar gun when they see a car that visually looks like they're going too fast. As the car gets closer, the officer turns on the gun, he locks you in, even though you've got a radar detector that's going crazy right now inside your vehicle, you're getting a speeding ticket. Your radar detector did not work the way it was attended. So for me, I look at them as a false sense of security and a big waste of money. So let's take a little closer look at radar. Hi, I'm Bo Babkin. We're coming to you from the Cottonwood Heights. See how he puts it up to his eye. The next question is, how does a radar gun work, or how does radar work? There's so he two puts different it down, types of radar up, in, in our world right in. now, and there's many, there are others, but the two I'll talk about is, one is, is regular radar, which we call, which is a frequency-based type of radar, and then we have LIDAR, which is laser, which is a, uh, the acuity of a laser uh, radar gun is pretty close to being perfect. I mean, you can, from many, many hundreds of feet, you can put a, a laser on the, the, the front of a license plate and measure uh, how fast somebody's going, as opposed to the other one I talked about briefly before, and that's the, that's the regular radar or the frequency radar where it sends out a, a frequency and it, it calculates how fast somebody's going. Sometimes, uh, some, or most of the time, an officer will be standing stationary and that machine will measure the speed of a vehicle and how fast it's going. Um, there are other situations where we can measure the speed of a vehicle as well when um, a, a patrol car or a police car is going in one direction and a car is coming in the other direction. Uh, that machine that's being used is, is measuring the speed of the actual vehicle that's going to measure it and measuring the speed of the vehicle coming towards. So it's, a, it's really a quite a machine, and I know it, we don't have enough time to really explain all of it, but I know they, they work very well, one on frequency, one on laser beam, if you will. So what they're actually doing is that they're setting up, and a lot of people say this is entrapment. You know, they're set up on the side of the road, right around a corner, up over a hill. They're not making you speed. It's not entrapment, okay? Um, so just be aware of that. I think that let me, um, we still got a little bit ways to go with fi finishing up speed. I think what we're going to do is the section on turning that we weren't able to do earlier in the week on Monday and the rest of this speed, we'll do that. We'll do that tomorrow. We'll try to wrap everything up so we can get right into the, to the midterm on on Monday but I want to put up here on the board one last time let's see if I can find it I don't even know where I put it I thought I had my my notes so remember if you can drive tomorrow at 8 or 9 I've got Saturday I still can't find where I put it I hmm Saturday, I think I've got 9, 11, and all afternoon. So if you can drive in the afternoon, I think the afternoon is what I'm looking for. Saturday afternoon. If you can drive, please put that in your comments in a text message. Uh, make sure that you have read uh, sections uh, 5 and 8 in the manual because we'll kind of get into that tomorrow. So there really isn't much homework. Um, I am going to link 
since we finish up on sign signals, payment markings, I will give you another worksheet that I want you to do that's a little bit uh, better than the, the chapter test that you did. So go on um, tomorrow morning. I'll put a link to a, a worksheet that I want you to do and hand it in for me for the weekend. But we're going to finish up some loose ends tomorrow and get everything so next week we can get right into the, um, into the midterm. So please, those that haven't driven, please start signing up. I want to start moving things along. So that's it for tonight. Um, we'll see you tomorrow at 8 o'clock.